Good evening, everyone. Uh, nice to have you here. And uh, this evening lecture will be about antibiotic resistance and the One Health perspective, which I will explain soon. So my name is uh, Joachim Larsson. I'm a professor in environmental pharmacology. So I work with pharmaceuticals in the environment. And I work particularly with antibiotic resistance and the environmental dimensions of antibiotic resistance. I'm also the director of the Center for Antibiotic Resistance Research here at the university, where Anne is one of the members as well. So, uh, let's start. So, what is a One Health perspective? Well, originally One Health was uh, a term that was used to describe the integration of human health and, and animal health and the health of our environment that surrounds us. So you can um, address many health issues from this, from this perspective. When it comes to antibiotic resistance, the One Health perspectives refers more specifically to the, the phenomenon that bacteria and bacterial genes can move between humans and animals and the environment in different ways. So all these three compartments are interconnected, meaning that we cannot deal with this problem just by looking at humans. We also need to look at animals and the environment at the same time, both to understand it and to manage the problem. So that's the one health perspective. Um, and this is something that has been stressed much recently in uh, action plans for how to manage antibiotic resistance. So there are action plans made by the World Health Organization, a global action plan on how to manage antibiotic resistance. And here, One Health is, is uh, addressed in several times. But then there's also national action plans for lots of different countries. Sweden has its own plan, their own plan here. And we also take a One Health approach. approach. So I'll start now by talking a bit about animals. And then we'll move later into the environment part. Right? So animals, we use antibiotics in animals quite a lot, and for different reasons. Uh, we use it, obviously, to treat infections. Pretty much the same way as we do with uh, ourselves. Uh, this can have economical value if we talk about farming animals, but also emotional values to treat them, of course, if they're your pet animals. Both types of animals are, are important to treat so that they don't suffer. Similar to the situation with humans, we also use antibiotics to prevent uh, infection during outbreaks, for example. And this can be particularly important in animals which you, when you keep many animals together, and there's an outbreak, and that calls for a need to actually protect the others somehow. Some places of the world, uh, you know, there's a lot of routine prevention of disease, or infectious diseases, uh, through giving the animals antibiotics. And last, well, it can also be used to promote growth. It's been known for a long time that animals that are giving low doses, low continuous doses of antibiotics, grow better. Uh, this can have different reasons. It may, in some cases, prevent uh, bad bacteria and bugs from being in your gut and basically stealing your energy. But it may also have other functions by changing your microflora that in turn changes the signaling to your brain and how the entire body works. Because we're in an intricate interplay between the microbiota in our guts and our entire body. 
But what's very clear is that low levels of antibiotics usually makes animals grow better. And this has been used worldwide for a long time to increase production of meat. When you produce meat, um, you usually want to do that cost efficiently. So uh, one strategy is often to put many animals together in a small space. But crowding, putting many animals close together, uh, increases risks for transmission of various infectious diseases. And you can manage that in different ways. You can manage it by really good hygiene, or you can give them antibiotics. And antibiotics have for a long time been the, the simple and cheap way to uh, manage transmission risks. So not only have the antibiotics been used then to promote the, their growth, but also to keep them healthy. It's been a cheap solution. Um, so this means that a lot of animals have been and are still um, exposed to antibiotics. Uh, it is possible to avoid um, treatment of uh, animals in large crowds with antibiotics if you have sufficient hygiene. If you look at chicken, for example, I think last year, I think there was not an exact number, but maybe a couple of cases where chicken in Sweden were given antibiotics. It's not one that. The overwhelming majority of chicken in Sweden never gets antibiotics because we have good uh, conditions and uh, prevent transmission of diseases, diseases to come in to the farms. And that really reduces the need for antibiotic. So it, there are ways to circumvent it. Um, growth promotion, I mentioned, could also be used. Sometimes the same type of antibiotics as we use in, for humans or for treating sick animals are used for growth promotion. And that can drive resistance, of course. Uh, sometimes even other compounds can drive resistance to the uh, antibiotics that are really critical for us uh, uh, in human health. For example, avoparsin is a very complex molecule that is not used as a human antibiotic, was given to, to farm animals for, for, for many years as a growth promoting agent. Uh, but as you can see, it's very similar to this really, really important antibiotic vancomycin. It's used a lot in intensive care. And it turned out that the same resistance mechanisms that the bacteria develop against avoparsin actually also gives resistance to vancomycin. So basically you're driving vancomycin resistance by treating the animal with avoparsin. Now, this is not used anymore because it's been understood that this is a, a risk with this, at least in Europe. Uh, and one discovered this actually by, by finding uh, increases in vancomycin resistance uh, enterococci. And then they saw this link. Here's another example, colistin. I don't know if you've heard about this antibiotic. It's an old antibiotic that is actually associated with lots of side effects. So people really stopped using it decades ago when we found better alternatives. But as we have had more and more problems with resistance against later, better antibiotics, uh, parts of the world are now turning their eyes to colistin instead. For example, when we have carbapenem resistant uh, infections, colistin is usually something that still can work, but it's associated also with high risks. Now, colistin resistance is starting to spread around the world, mobile colistin resistance. And one reason for the emergence of mobile colistin resistance could very well be the widespread use of colistin in farm animals in Asia. For example, in India, they give they used to give, until very recently, uh, colistin in the feed water, regularly, all the time, to the chicken. 
which is a, is a last resort antibiotic. Now, just this year, I think they banned the use of colistin for, for these purposes in, in, uh, for animal use in India. So if we go to Sweden, uh, antibiotic use in humans is considerably larger than antibiotic use in animals, as you can see from this figure. Um, those animals that get the most antibiotics in Sweden are cows, and it's primarily penicillin-like antibiotics that are given to them. So not very broad spectrum, but actually rather narrow spectrum uh, uh, penicillins, which is good. If we take a look at the historical use or sales of antibiotics to animals in Sweden, we have a pretty clear pattern. This is a slide that shows the usage from 1980 to 2017. And it's expressed in milligram per kilogram live weight. So it's uh, sort of adjusted for, for the size of the animals. Uh, and there are three colors here. It's blue and it's green and it's purple. And the purple one is growth promotion. Growth promotion was banned in Sweden in 1986. I think it was the first country on earth that actually banned antibiotics for growth promotion purposes. Because people, scientists here, saw that there was a risk associated with this, that we will no longer have effective antibiotics. And this was not really a necessary use of the antibiotics. It took until 2006, until Europe had a ban on antibiotics for growth promotion. 20 years, they are now discussing it in the USA, for example. And as you will see soon, the use is very high in many parts of the world for growth promotion purposes still. So in 86, the growth promotion used stop, but you can see there was still quite a lot of group treatment, which is the, the greenish bars here. So when you give a, an entire herd uh, antibiotics, even if they're not sick, but maybe one animal is sick and you give the entire barn is given, uh, uh, given the antibiotic. But uh, with good practices and good infection control, this decreased and it's now very, very little. So almost all the antibiotics that are used now in Sweden are given to individual animals that are sick, which is really good. And this shouldn't probably be zero either because we don't want animals to suffer. We may not want to use the most precious antibiotics there. So some antibiotics are not used for animals, such as carbapenems, for example. Uh, but um, so there, there should be some size here, of course, but it's uh, pretty small compared to many other countries. And as I mentioned, this is not the story in all parts of the world. Here is the antibiotic use in animals in the USA between 2009 and 2014, and the meat production stays approximately the same. So. Per kilogram meat, we are, they're using more and more antibiotics. And if we look at the European Union, these are the numbers you see. The, the different colors here refers to different classes of antibiotics, as you can see on the right. You can see here that the most common type of antibiotics are overall the tetracyclines, followed by, I think, the, the, the beta-lactams, the, the penicillin-like antibiotics, which are the, the ones here up in lighter blue. And Sweden is here. You see the penicillin-likes are the biggest one here. But if you look at the size here of the bar of Sweden and compare it to the rest, you see that we are pretty good, pretty well off. There are some other countries that also have very low usage, Iceland, for example, Norway. Um, both of these have a lot of fish production. And in contrary to what many people think, at least the salmon farming that is here in, in uh, Scandinavia, and particularly in Norway, they don't use antibiotic. They used to use that some decades ago, but nowadays they are 
They are vaccinating each individual little fish to prevent bacterial diseases. And thereby, they have been able to reduce antibiotic use by 99% or more, which is a fantastic thing, actually, reducing antibiotic use. So Norway has also a very low, even lower usage per kilogram uh, live weight of animals. Some countries have very high, Spain, Italy, Cyprus, for example. So uh, a general trend is perhaps that Southern Europe uses more antibiotics than Northern Europe, on average. If we look even wider and look at global sales of antibiotics, uh, to animals, we see here that well, several classes are approximately equally big. Quine alones are pretty big, which is a bit scary because these are broad spectrum antibiotics that are known to drive resistance, tetracycline, penicillins, uh, sulfonamides. Mostly, of course, those that are pretty cheap, inexpensive to buy, are used the most. Less so of those that are more expensive, like cephalosporins, polymyxins. And if you look at the different types of animals, pigs dominate. They use about half of the antibiotics that are given to animals are used to pigs, followed by chicken and cattle and sheep. And that covers most of it, right? And as you see, these are, are uh, meat-producing animals and eggs there, of course. Also. If you then put a map up and see where, is, where are these antibiotics used, then it looks roughly like this. Now, exact figures are quite difficult to get, but these are some of the latest uh, estimations. So this is a science publication from 2017. And the size here of the ring represents how much is used. And you see there's another color, maybe you see that there's a darker color here, that is the predicted. Uh, or projected use in, in 2030. So if it's growing. You cannot see the mark here in Sweden because it's so small. We also, of course, don't have a huge population, but still 10 million. Uh, the really, really dominating thing here is in China. And these are the pigs in China. Pigs in China consume a major portion of the world's antibiotics. And the demand for pig meat in China is increasing with a more wealthy population. Uh, so, so if one wants to address the overall usage of antibiotics, here is probably something that would have a big impact. But also the use in the United States and here in some countries in South America, Spain, etc. Of course, if you use a lot of an, uh, antibiotics in animals, there is a problem that that will spawn resistance in those bacteria that animals are exposed to. So it's a problem for animal health, sure. But it could also be a problem for human health because bacteria can spread from animals to pigs directly like this or in more indirect ways. Um, so here's just some of the ways and how it can be transmitted. Um, if you have farmed animals, you can have bacteria, resistant bacteria from this, that can go via animal waste, fecal residues, to soil, water and air, etc. And then we get exposed to water, soil, air, etc. and can reach us. It can contaminate the actual product in some cases. If you get fecal mater material, for example, on the meat when slaughtering and preparing the meat, that can be a more direct route to us also. And we know that that happens for some types of bacteria. Uh, sometimes you uh, produce animal feed from other animals and that in turn can, can, can spread, for, spread again, right? So it can go via animal feed. And then, of course, it can go directly 
to the people that work with the animals, the farmers, for example. And there are actually plenty of examples uh, of uh, where farmers are much more prone to be carriers of certain antibiotic-resistant bacteria than other people in society. For example, MRSA. Uh, so in, in some countries, uh, farmers are treated differently when they enter hospital than non-farmers because this, they're so likely to be a carrier of uh, resistant bacteria. Not so in Sweden, though. So we say bacteria, but there's uh, different types of bacteria, and they spread in different ways. And some uh, of these bacteria uh, spread directly from animals to, to, to us. They are pathogens, both in animals and us. So Salmonella and Campylobacter are two very classical animal pathogens that can contaminate food and we get sick from these, right? I mentioned MRSA, which is actually a skin bacterium, uh, and that can also sometimes spread from animals to humans, uh, but also um, extended spectrum beta-lactam um, beta lactam resistant enterobacteriaceae in E. coli for example, can also spread from animals to humans. They don't spread freely because there tend to be certain strains that like animals better, or pigs and cows, etc., and certain strains that like humans better, but there is a flow of genes, at least occasionally there, a flow of bacteria occasionally, which can be enough. Let's talk about what we can do about it. So, an obvious thing we can do is eat more vegetables. That's probably a good thing from many points of view, not the least for the climate. Uh, and probably, for most of us, it's probably good for our health in general also to eat more vegetables. Because if you eat more vegetables, you need to produce less meat. And with less meat demand, there is less use of antibiotics as well. So an indirect way, but probably a good way. But most of us, at all, but most of us like to eat some meat and do not become vegetarians. So if you're then buying animal products, you could take a look at yourself, look yourself and see, is there any information here that can tell me whether these meat products or milk products or egg products are produced under good hygiene conditions with minimum use of antibiotics? Different countries have different regulations. So it's likely that, um, for example, uh, meat produced in Sweden is likely to be associated with less use of antibiotics than if you buy meat from, for example, Spain, as we just show here. The comparison in Swedish stores is usually between Swedish meat, Danish meat, German meat, or South American meat. And on a scale, they're using more and more antibiotics. In general, doesn't mean that that particular animal needs to be treated with antibiotics. The risk is largely not that you will get an infection by eating this meat. Probably in most cases, it's by promoting the use of antibiotic and thereby other transmission routes, such as the route from the animal to the farmer, and then further into society, and eventually down the road, it may hit us as well. If we talk about particularly Salmonella and Campylobacter, it's about good, good kitchen hygiene, of course. Do you have any other ideas what we can do? Well, we can, of course, act also uh, on a more societal level. These are the more the direct actions that you can do as a consumer, or as a person. But you can, of course, also engage in these questions and try to work to change legislation. Okay, I actually think that uh, this serves as a good natural break. Uh, 